Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go ahead and get your King James Bibles out and follow along. We are going to be talking today about 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Okay, this is going to be part one of a series of studies because someone asked me to do a study on the on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. So let's read it real quick. So turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Someone asked if I could do a Bible study on this verse, and we're going to do a Bible study on this verse, and we're going to break it up and go it into pieces. So the first part of this study is going to be the God was manifest in the flesh. Now the first thing is, is the mystery of godliness. Brother Brian has talked about this at King James Video Ministries. Brother JT has talked about it. Um, some of the other brethren out there have talked about it. But the mystery of godliness is, remember, you get really deceived by the world when you get these people that are puffed up. Okay, knowledge puffeth up. The Bible talks about ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, the truth of the matter is, is we, the Bible will tell us what things are. And sometimes it will tell us how things work. But there's a lot of things that we don't know. The how is what we don't know. And that scares a lot of these intellectuals and, you know, I gotta know everything, I gotta be smart, I've gotta keep the lady down and I'm up here and I've gotta be smart and I've gotta have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, brother and sister in Christ. How the Godhead works, I don't know. I just know what the Bible says is the Godhead. But right now, the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What we're going to be talking about is how God was manifest in the flesh. What does that mean? What does the Bible say it means? Now, there's going to be a lot of things we're going to be talking about that I'm going to have to say. I don't know how that's possible. It's something I can't fathom. That's the mystery of godliness as we go through these things. Okay? So God was manifest in the flesh. Turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. When Jesus... When it talks about God was manifest in the flesh, what's it talking about? I'm just going to give a summary of what we're going to be going through and talking about. The Old Testament, he had a corrupt, an incorruptible body. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's what it means by God was manifest in the flesh. It's not saying Jesus is a created being, which is a false teaching. They always try to tear Jesus down and make him not God. He's not equal to God. He might be his own little God over here on the side. He's a lesser God. He's God the Son. But he's not capital G, God, the Father. Okay, they always try to tear Jesus down. Okay. But in the Old Testament, he had an incorruptible body. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's God manifest in the flesh. And when he comes back, he's going to come back in a glorified, incorruptible body. It's not just an incorruptible body, but it's a glorified body. Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. I can hear chickens down, down the hillside. Looks like they're being attacked. Romans 1.20 We're going to read 2.23 For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His internal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And here it is. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. This is important. Remember that verse. But became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. In the Old Testament, when you read stories, we'll read one of them, but when you read the stories in the Old Testament about the angel of the Lord, when he showed up, there was something different about him. I'm talking about they stood, at, they stood out. Angels, when they showed up, they looked like men. They were men. But if you read in the Old Testament how the God's people would treat these men, they saw that there was still something a little different about them. They're men. They look like men. But there's something special about them. There's something different about them. When Jesus came, he came as a lamb lowly 
mild, humble, meek. Okay, he got tired, he got hungry. He wasn't this great, incorruptible body king that they were looking forward to. This, you know, just, he came, the Bible says that there was no, no beauty in him that we should desire him. He was a common man. But you go back over here and it says, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. When they knew God, what is this talking about? Jesus Christ, when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was just a humble, lowly, meek, and humble. Okay? And uh, he's not coming back that way. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and foolish heart was darkened. In the Old Testament, you look, that they keep rejecting, you have the angel of the Lord comes down, and they think they've seen God. Okay, there was a time where um, I'm reading now, listening to uh, Samson. Before he was born, uh, the angel of the Lord comes down, and she says, there's a man that came and talked to me and told me that I'm going to have a child. And the husband says, okay, well, let's see if the, uh, the husband asks the Lord if the man will appear again. And then the man appears again, and he doesn't realize he's talking to God. He thinks he's talking to a messenger of God. Like, but he doesn't realize he's talking to the angel of God. And you keep reading that story. And when he finds out he's, I, we just seen the angel of God. They hit their face to the ground in fear thinking they're going to be struck down dead. Why? Because well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. But no man has seen God at any time. And lived. No man can see God the Father, the soul. Because of our sin and our wickedness. We can't be in the presence of God the Father. We can be in the presence of the body. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The angel of the Lord was there. And then his wife tells him that if he wanted to kill us, he wouldn't, accept our, he wouldn't have accepted our offering. It's a good story. It's in Judges um, about Samson when he's born and everything. Okay, But you have the angel of the Lord showing up in the flesh, physically. And when they see this uh, through the Old Testament, they keep rejecting him, the God, the God of all the universe, and they keep wanting man as God. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but we're going to talk about how they rejected Jesus as king in the Old Testament. They rejected Jesus as king when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And they rejected Jesus. They're not going to be rejecting Jesus as king when he comes the third time. They always say it's his second coming. The third time, they're not going to be rejecting Jesus as king. He's going to come and rule with the rod of iron. And he's not coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's going to be coming in an incorruptible body, but not just an incorruptible body like the Old Testament. He's coming in a glorified, incorruptible body. Okay. Uh, 1 Samuel 8.1 Let's go back to the first time they rejected Jesus. What body was he in when they rejected Jesus the first time as being king? 1 Samuel 8. This is the Old Testament. Eight, one. We're going to read one and keep going. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judge over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abia, if I pronounce it, Abia. They were judges in Beersheba. Now, I went through, uh, when you go through judges, you find out that they had captains. Like jo uh, Joshua was a captain. And then they'd have people that God would raise up to be captains over them, to judge them, and judge Israel. Okay. And that's where we're getting to here. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. When God would raise people to judge the people, they were supposed to look at it as God judging them. Okay, it's not like his two sons, they're evil, they're wicked, they're not of God. They're not doing things God's way. But they look at Samuel and say, you're the one judging us, instead of saying, God's judging through you. If God's judging through you, God will raise up another man to judge. Your two sons are evil, God will raise up somebody who isn't evil. And he did, as you read through the Testaments. I mean, the Old Testament. You read through the um, 
judges. Okay, there was times they were wicked. Then there was times where God would raise somebody up to help free them from the punishment that he had for them, letting other countries come in and destroy them. Okay. Verse 6, But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. Like I said, the physical manifestation in the Old Testament of God was Jesus Christ. It's the body. He wasn't known as Jesus Christ. Okay? Angel, it always talks to him about being the angel of the Lord. But here we see that they have rejected me that I should reign over them. Verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt. All these signs and wonders and that they would still turn on God in a heartbeat. After everything God did, proving himself that he is God fully and completely, all those plagues in Egypt, brothers and sisters in Christ, they were an attack on the Egyptian gods. God Almighty, you know, the Most High God to the Gentiles, uh, at, back in the Old Testament um, with Nebuchadnezzar, but God Almighty proved that He's God. Of, you know, He's King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's God fully and completely. And they still kept turning to false gods. They kept turning to the world, complaining, whining. Brought them out of Egypt even unto this day, wherein they have forsaken me and served other gods. We read up there how they, in um, Romans 120 through 123, and change, verse 123 says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an uncorruptible man, and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They kept going to other gods, no matter how much the Lord proved Himself to them. You'd get a um, over time, pe people will be born and raised that wouldn't know God. But even when they brought him out of Egypt, there was people that saw all the great things he did and would still reject him for false gods. So they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice. Howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Right? I always teach that this is God. Jesus, the angel of the Lord, he would come and talk to certain people throughout the Old Testament. Moses saw Jesus, okay, face to face. Okay, um, this is Jesus. They're not rejecting because if you believe Jesus is God fully and completely, like I do, when they're rejecting God as reigning over him, they're rejecting Jesus as reigning over him in the Old Testament. All right, Jesus is the body. You can't get away from that. But they served other gods. So when this man comes up and shows up, and uh, Matthew. This man shows up, mild, lowly, humble, meek, a lamb, the lamb of God. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He grows old. He gets tired. He gets hungry. Hey, he's just, he's like one of us. He's, eh, he can't be God. He just, he can't be God. And a lot of the people there didn't want him to be God. Why? Because they didn't want him to be God in the Old Testament. They didn't want God ruling over him and reigning over him. Okay? They didn't want him to be God when he first, the second time he came. But the third time, I always teach this, you know, I'm not into sports, but the whole thing about three strikes and you're out. The third time that Jesus comes back in his glorified, incorruptible body, there is no choice. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to prove it. He's king. He's God. King of kings. Capital K king of lowercase k kings. Capital L Lord over lowercase L Lords. He's God fully and completely. And he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. Turn to John 1.18. John 1.18 says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. You get a lot of people that will say, oh, 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 you can't see the soul, you can't see the spirit, you can only see the body. In the Old Testament, angel of the Lord, you, when you saw a body that was the angel of the Lord, God was speaking through that body, talking to the people, that's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He just wasn't known as Jesus Christ. 
No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, what does begotten mean? Born of, derived from. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. We learn about the Godhead in the New Testament. That's revealed to us. It wasn't revealed to them in the Old Testament. It's revealed to us in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they had God, the Father. They had the angel of the Lord. And you have the Spirit of God. That's why King David in the Psalms is saying, Please don't take thy spirit from me. The three parts are still there. The three members of the Godhead, if you want to say it that way. Some people complain about saying parts. Some people want to say members. Body, soul, spirit were there in the Old Testament. No man hath seen God at any time. You don't have to turn there, but John 6, 46, another part where it says, not that, any, not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Talking about Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 12 says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. No man hath seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. 1 John 4, 12. God dwelleth in us? No, we have the Holy Spirit in us. If you, don't, if you believe the Trinity, then you don't believe in the King James Bible. You believe it has all kinds of error, because that's an error right there, because they're three separate persons. And, you know, sometimes they'll try to say, well, that means God the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't. It means God the Father. No man hath seen God at any time. It's talking about the Father, the soul. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfect, perfected in us. What do we have in us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is connected to God the Father. That's how, that's how this verse can say God is in us, when you have the Holy Spirit in us. You know what? The Holy Spirit is connected to Jesus, the body. That's why we can say when we have the Holy Spirit in us, that we have Jesus in us. That's how we can say we're part of the body of Christ talked about this in the past where uh, uh, spiritual circumcision this body my soul is no longer connected to this body you know what my soul is connected to Jesus Christ that's how I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now you have the Holy Spirit in us that severs our soul connection from our soul and our body so our soul is now connected to uh, Jesus Christ that's why we're called the body of Christ but the point that I'm trying to make is no man has seen God at any time. The soul, you can't see God the Father. You can't see the soul. What can you see? The body. 1 John 4.20, it reads, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar, for he, hath, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? This is John the disciple whom Jesus loved, he saw the body of God. He saw God, but he saw the body. What's he talking about? He's talking about the God in heaven, the soul. No man have seen God at any time. Okay? But you say, there's so many times when people say, well, I love Jesus, I love God, I love God. And I know today we haven't seen Jesus. John did, because he was a disciple, or an apostle, if I say it right. But we haven't seen Jesus, but someday we will, praise the Lord. And we haven't seen God. And we say, and you see all these people, these fanatics out there, oh, I love God, I love God, I love God. And you look at how they treat their brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what John is correcting them on. Look at how you're treating one another, your brothers and sisters in Christ. How can you, that say that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can you say you love God whom he not, hath not seen? Genesis 18.1 Okay, Genesis 18.1. We're going to go back. Remember, who you have not seen. God the Father, you cannot see Him. Now, this isn't a study on the Godhead. I've got plenty of videos on the Godhead. But body, soul, and spirit, you can only see the body. You can't see the soul. You can't see the spirit. People say, what about John the Baptist? He saw the glory of the Lord coming down. God surrounded the Holy Ghost with the, His glory. So John the Baptist, and it was just for John the Baptist, I believe only John the Baptist saw it, nobody else. It was a sign for a Jew, and a specific Jew, John the Baptist, because I did a teaching on that. Um, the Lord showed me through his word, praise the Lord. But remember how the glory of the Lord manifests itself. Fire, smoke, or cloud, or light. Those are the three manifestations of the glory of the Lord. So God surrounded the Holy Ghost with his glory, 
which was a cloud, I believe. And when it came down, it came down like as a dove. A dove is gray and white. Clouds are gray and white. And the way the cloud was moving as it came down, it looked like a dove. It wasn't a dove. It was like as a dove. Okay? Remember, you can't see God. In the Old Testament, Jesus had an incorruptible body. We're going to read about that. Genesis 18.1. Genesis 18.1 And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. This is Abraham. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. The Lord appeared. Remember, no man had seen God at any time. That goes clear back to the Old Testament. So who are they seeing? It said the Lord appeared to him. What do we learn in 1 Corinthians 8, 6? There's but one capital G, God, the Father, and one capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ. And the Lord appeared to him. That's the body. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. It's a man. The body of, Jesus, of, of God, Jesus Christ, is a man. I know it's so hard for some people. It's a man. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. And at first, some people will try to say, well, it's a ghost. It's just a ghost. You know, it's, it's just a, you know, an apparition or just a figment of, of Abraham's imagination. You know, God's just giving him a vision. It's a vision. No, it's a physical body. Let's keep reading. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet. And rest yourself under the tree. So he washed their feet. That's physical. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, Do so do as thou hast said. That's where I'm stopping. Do as they, thou hast said. It's physical. So Abraham gets some food and they eat food. So he washes their feet, he eats food, he gets some food, and they eat food. This is all physical. Remember what Jesus said. Turn to Luke chapter 24, 33. I'm going to read this real quick. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them. and breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Remember what we just read about the, the angel of the Lord. The Lord himself, it didn't say angel, it said the Lord himself presented himself to him, appeared to him. They washed their feet and they ate. This isn't a vision. Abraham's not sitting there having this vision like it's a dream, like a day... Like when you get to daydreaming, or you're asleep and you're actually dreaming. No, this is real. How do we know? Let's keep reading. They think they're seeing a spirit. Maybe it's a vision. Maybe I ate something bad and it's just it's messing with my head. No. Verse 38. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thy and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? That's I'm not trying to add to scripture. That's why I just said that thoughts arise in your. Maybe I ate something bad. Maybe I'm seeing things. Maybe I need to clean my glasses. I don't, what? Huh? Is that a ghost? Is that a spirit? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. What did Abraham do? He got water for him to wash his feet. Handle me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. It's the body. Let's keep reading. Verse 40. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? 
and they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. What do we read in Abraham? He washed their feet. Here's Jesus, touch me. Touch my hands, my feet. Know that I'm real. Then he got, what did Abraham do? He gave him food. And they did eat. It was the angel of the Lord. It was Jesus Christ and two angels. People say, no, it was just three angels. No, it's Jesus Christ and two angels. They ate. It wasn't some figment of imagination. It wasn't a, a God giving them a vision during the day like daydreaming or a vision in a dream, you know. This was real. Colossians 1.9 Turn to Colossians 1.9 For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, God gives us understanding, but sometimes we're not going to always know how things work. I don't know how it works in the Old Testament, how God, uh, how things work. Okay? You had the angel of the Lord. Um, in the Old Testament, you read about the uh, Moses, the burning bush. It says the angel of the Lord was in the bush. But it was the Holy Spirit that's in the bush. Remember, you can't see the Spirit, so how does God make the Holy Spirit manifest sometimes? Physically, fire, cloud, smoke, light. The Holy Spirit was in the bush. It was burning. And we learn in the New Testament that whatever he heareth, that shall he speak. So it was the angel of the Lord speaking through the Holy Spirit, who is God, the angel of the Lord, who is God, speaking through the Holy Spirit in the burning bush to Moses. Let that sink in. as the Godhead in the Old Testament right there. How does it work? I don't know. Great is the mystery of godliness. I can only tell you what is. Jesus is, and we're going to get here, the image of God. He's the physical image of God. And he had a body in the Old Testament that was incorruptible. Um, verse 11. Oh no, verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, God wants us to know more about Him. He's revealed more and more to him, of Himself to me as I stay in His Word and I study His Word. And He'll do the same thing for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Why is it such a hard understanding? There's a lot of false teaching out there. Jesus is a created being, which means Jesus wasn't there in the Old Testament. No, we're going to get into it. Uh, I know this is kind of, we're kind of going around a little bit, but we're going to get into the body that was created, the likeness of sinful flesh. But Jesus was there in the Old Testament. Jesus was there from the very beginning of the world. Remember John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And people can't handle that. Body and soul, connected. They're one. You have the body in the beginning, you have the soul in the, in the beginning. And they're connected, making them one. That's why it says, and the Word was God. They try to teach in the Trinity that there's no connection. Yeah, there is. Jesus is not God the Father. God the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus. There's no connection. The Bible teaches all through the Bible. There's connection. God wants us to know Him. He's given us His Word. He's given us the Holy Spirit, His Spirit, the Spirit of God in us that will bring us into all truth so we can know our God, our Lord and Savior better. And you got people out there that are trying to confuse you. Stick with the Word of God. Trust the Lord. Believe in His Word. Stay in this book, reading it all the time. Verse 11. Strengthen with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joy and, fu and fullness. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We now get to be inheritance with the Jewish people. Okay. Who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Capital S, Son. Talking about Jesus Christ. 
So talking about God the Father wants us to know him more through who? Jesus Christ, the body, the capital S, Son of God, of God, connection. And whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Remember what I just mentioned, 1 John, or not 1 John, John 1. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus was there from the very beginning. He created all things, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. When it talks about he's the... People always get there and say, well, what about where it says he's the firstborn of every creature? He was the first one to be raised. Okay, as far as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ... He said he opened the door, the path, he went the direction that we have to go. You have to get saved. He went down to Abraham's bosom and led captivity captive and freed all those people. Okay, it took the blood of Jesus Christ to save the world. He started it, we follow. Him. Firstborn. Now it says he's the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That's why the Bible always clears itself up. Well, it says here he's the firstborn. That means he was created, right? No, it's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He's been given a glorious body. The Bible talks about, I'm getting ahead of myself, that when we see him, we will be like him. Okay? He's not that lowly lamb anymore. He's not that likeness of sinful flesh when he comes back. And neither will we when we come back with him. That in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The soul is, God the Father is in Jesus Christ. To writ that God was in Christ. That's in the scriptures. God was in Christ. God the Father, which is the soul, was in Christ. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God was in him. Okay, the fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There we see the blood of the cross. Okay? The image. He's the image of the invisible God. Once again, the body. God was manifest in the flesh so the world could see him. Jesus Christ. If Jesus did not come in the likeness of sinful flesh, God manifest in the flesh, he couldn't bleed for, for us on the cross. He couldn't take on the sins of the world. What do we read right there? It says, and having made peace through the what? Blood of the cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. All things. He planned this out from the very beginning, brother and sister Christ, to die on the cross. He came to be their king in an incorruptible body in the Old Testament, and they rejected him. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. I'm getting ahead of myself, but talk about the first Adam. He's the second Adam. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he was perfect. Adam was perfect. He wasn't in an incorruptible body. He had to eat from the tree of life to sustain him. But he was innocent, he was perfect, until he ate and became incorruptible, or became corruptible when he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, that's why Jesus was referred to as the second Adam. He came, and he was like the first Adam, perfect. There's no tree of life, so he grows old, but he's perfect. Mm -hmm. Since we're talking about Adam, let's talk about Adam, okay? I didn't put this in my notes, but you go to Adam, you talk, uh, you go back to Genesis uh, chapter 2, I think it is, where it talks about he's creating Adam. He creates Adam in the image, and it says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, okay? Two things. I've always taught this, and you have brothers and sisters in Christ, some of them out there really get on to me, because they just, they still like to say, everybody was made in the image of God. 
Well, I hate to tell you this, brothers and sisters Christ, I'm not made in the image of God. A lot of you go, what? No, I'm made in the likeness of God. Well, what image are you made in then? I'm made in the image of Adam after he fell. That's the image I'm made in. Okay, this is a whole other study. I don't want to get, get into it. Maybe some other time, if the Lord willing, we can get into it. But I've had other brethren who've done this study. Peter Ruckman, I remember listening to a study he did. He talked about it. Adam had the image of God until he fell. And every person after him, man or woman after him, has the image of Adam. We have a corrupted body. Not just a corruptible one like Adam had before the fall. We have a corrupted body. Jesus, when he came, he has the body like Adam had before the fall. In the sense that he's capable of corrupted, corruption, but he saw no corruption. Okay? People want us to teach, well, Jesus could have sinned if he wanted to. No, he couldn't. Jesus cannot sin because he is God fully and completely. But he came in a body of likeness of sinful flesh. Why? Because he was preparing the moment he was born... The birth of Jesus Christ to a Virgin Mary, the only begotten Son, God manifest in the flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh. The moment he was born, he was preparing himself to die. He was preparing himself to die on the cross to take on the sins of the world. His old body in the Old Testament, because you ask yourself, well, why didn't he just come back like he did in the Old Testament? Why didn't, he come, why didn't he come back the second time, what I call the second time, but some people say the first time, why didn't he come back that time like he's going to come back in, uh, at the end of time of Jacob's trouble? He came the way he did because he planned on dying for the sins of the world. He knew what he had to do. He had it all planned out. This is God. He has it all planned out, brothers and sisters of Christ. Trust him. Believe in him. That image that the Bible's talking about in Genesis, let us make man, it's talking about man, not mankind, man. And I've already done a study on it where it shows separation. Man created he him, man and woman created he them. Two separate creations. Man was created in the image of God. God is a man, Adam is a man. Okay, that's the image. An image is something that you can physically See, and I keep preaching this, brother says Christ, and there still get people that fight me on it. What did we just read? Verse 15, Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God. God is invisible, the soul, but the body isn't. Image is always something you can physically see. Adam was made in the image of Jesus Christ. Image is talking about the body. His body was like Jesus Christ. He's a man. Jesus Christ is a man. Okay, that's the image there. Body, soul, and spirit. So when it says God was manifest in the flesh, it's not saying Jesus is a created being. It's saying that Jesus gave up his incorruptible body so he could come down here and be created in a body of, uh, that's uh, likeness of sinful flesh. That body that's likeness of sinful flesh was created. But he had a body in the Old Testament. Okay. What's that created body that I'm talking about? The likeness of sinful flesh? Uh, Psalms 8.4. If you want to turn there real quick. Psalms 8.4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Okay. We, are, we, brothers and sisters of Christ, we are made a little lower than the angels. Turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. It's the only way he could have died on the cross, is if he was made, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. A, a flesh that could take on sin because it was corruptible, yet he himself, the Bible says, he became sin who knew no sin. He himself was perfect, proving he was God. That's God manifest in the flesh. But he was in a body that was capable of taking on the sins of the world. God was manifest in the flesh. We see that there. Made little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. 
This is telling you that's who was his purpose. That's why he came to die on the cross. Crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Absolutely. Romans 8.1. Turn to Romans 8.1. When it talks about God was manifest in the flesh, I'm going to just keep running this home. It's talking about that Jesus came in a body that was capable of sin, yet he knew no sin. Why? Because he's God. We're born, and when we're born into this world, we get into sin right away. Okay, We're born into a world of sin, and we are sinners from the get-go. Jesus was born perfect. As far as sinless. He didn't have a perfect body. He gave up his perfect body. But he was perfect as far as sinless. He never sinned. Um, Romans 8.1. That's where we get that, um, the verse that I keep quoting. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's a good thing, brothers and sisters Christ. There's no more condemnation. We've been freed from the law of sin and death. We're not going to go to hell when you get saved and born again. And here it is. Here's the changed life. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Capital S Spirit. That's evidence that you're no longer under condemnation, which is in Christ Jesus. That's evidence that you're in Christ Jesus. You don't walk after the flesh anymore. Your desire is for the Word of God. You still sin. You still make mistakes. I've let God down. But my heartfelt desire here is not to sin. It's not the ways of the world. It's not the flesh. I'm not fleshly minded, carnally minded, walking after the flesh anymore when you get saved. The Holy Spirit comes in, starts opening the book to you, and you start having a love for God's Word and living God's Word. You love making, letting, you say, Lord, make changes in my life. Please, please make changes in my life. Okay? Verse 2 For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of the Spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus? We read about that a little bit. The death on the cross, the blood that was shed. He had to taste death to free us from the law of sin and death. That's what it took. Free me from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, there's no way that we could overcome the law in our flesh. But you know who did overcome the law in the likeness of sinful flesh? Jesus Christ. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why? So He could overcome the law of sin and death for us. God knew from the very beginning we couldn't overcome the law of sin and death. There's, there's nothing in my hands I bring, sim simply to the cross I cling. There's nothing in my hands I bring. I can't do any good works to make up, to satisfy the law of sin and death. There's nothing I can do to make that payment. But there's something Jesus did for us. And that what breaks my heart is what's going on today. We're in the last days. Most of the people don't want Jesus Christ. They refuse to repent. They refuse to have sorrow in their heart because their sins are the reason He had to die on that cross. And they don't have that sorrow. They refuse to repent. They refuse to give up their carnally minded and walking after the flesh. Pleasures of the flesh. Pleasures of sin. Sin for a season. They don't want to give that up. And we've got a lot of false converts today. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. But we see there, that's where I get that verse from and I say it a lot. The likeness of sinful flesh. That's what was created. He had to come and had to give up his incorruptible body to come in the likeness of sinful flesh so he could take on the sins of the world. The moment he was born, brothers and sisters in Christ, he planned to die for us. There's prophecy in the Old Testament prophesying all of this. Why? Because it was the only way. Jesus is in the garden praying, saying, Lord, if, if it be possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will. People say, well, why would he say that if he was God? He was saying it for our benefit, which is why it's written down, to let us know that 
There was no other way. That's why that was there. Jesus did a lot of things for our benefit so we can know him better and understand there was no other way. He had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh. God the Father was manifest in the flesh. And when you say Jesus is not God the Father, you're saying that's not God manifest in the flesh. There's only one capital G, God the Father. 2 Corinthians 5.17 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Remember, he's the firstborn and we're to follow. He was the old man that took on all the sins of the world. Now, remember, he was sinless, but the old man that took on the sins of the world was dead and buried. God manifests in the flesh. The new man is raised the glorified body of Jesus Christ, incorruptible, son of the living God, okay? Firstborn. Now we're to follow that suit. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Our old man that is sinful and wicked, not taking on the sins of the world, we are sinful and wicked. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. And the new man is raised. We're to follow suit. There is therefore... Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. New creature in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by who? Jesus Christ, the body. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. This is where I get this, brother and sister Christ, because you heard me say it, that God was in Christ. The Bible says it. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be reconciled to God. We pray you in Christ's stead. How many times do we pray for brethren? Not brethren, I'm sorry. Brethren, how many times do we pray for loved ones, family, friends? My daughter, my mom, my grandma almost went through surgery and could have died. And I pray for her every opportunity, Lord, give her every opportunity to get saved. We pray for them to be reconciled to God. Neighbors, okay. false converts, my ex-wife, I still pray for her to this day. That God gives her every opportunity to wake up, to see the, the lie and the deception, the great delusion that she's part of. Oh, I'm, I'm a Christian when she's not. Be reconciled to God. Verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. That's where I get that verse. He became sin for us, who knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteous of God in him. So we could go to heaven. So that we can be in God the Father's presence. Through Jesus Christ. Christ. God was manifest in the flesh. Once again, people say, well, God, eh. well, he's God the Son. He's a separate, remember, God the Son is not God the Father. They're separate. Okay? God the Father is the soul. We've proven what a body is. A body can eat. Okay? You can touch a body. Touch my hands, my feet. Wash my feet. Jesus went around washing the feet of the disciples. Of the apostles. Uh, we talked about Abraham washing the feet of the two angels and Jesus Christ. But he was known as the angel of the Lord or just Lord. When he, the Lord appeared to him, anytime he appears, the Lord appears in the flesh, it's Jesus Christ. Okay. What else does the body do? It bleeds. I bleed. You bleed. Guess what? Jesus bled when he died on the cross. Not just Jesus, but God. I know it's hard for some people. Turn to Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Acts 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Oh, it's, it's Trinity. It's, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they just mess up the flock. They're not sparing the flock. They're trying to destroy the Word of God and who the real Jesus Christ is to confuse people. Remember what I always said that Satan and his minions that like to trance... Remember, Satan's not an angel. God the Father is... I mean, sorry. God the Father is through Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Jesus is a star. Is referred to as a star. Satan wants to be like Jesus, so he wants to be referenced as a star. But instead, it talks about how G Satan likes to transform himself into an angel of light. And for no marvel, for his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. What's the works here? They're not sparing the flock. They're messing people up. Satan and his missions, if, you, if he can't keep you from getting saved, which he can't, if you don't get saved, it's your fault. I'm talking about the lost world. When I was lost, if I never got saved, it's my fault. It's not Satan. Satan can't, I can't sit there, it's his fault. You know, remember Adam, it's not my fault, it's your fault, God, because it's this woman you gave me, so it's your fault and it's this woman's fault. You can't do that. It's your fault if you don't get saved. But if he can't tempt you and, and, and really entice you to not get saved and you get saved, then his job is to mess you up as much as possible. And that's what we see going on in the world today. True Christianity in the world today has been just totally destroyed. The real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, the true Jesus Christ of Scripture, God manifests in the flesh, God the Father in the flesh, the body of God the Father, which is the soul, has been perverted. Wolves are coming in, not sparing the flock. Okay? Also of your own selves shall men arise. In other words, these wolves in sheep's clothing come in and they mess up Christians. And what do those Christians do? They pass on that me they mess up Christians. That's why the Bible talks about deceiving and being deceived. You've got people, I believe, are truly saved that are being deceived and they pass on that deception and they make a mess of things. And they've got to be corrected. Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Tears. Night and day with tears. The space of three years. Paul was crying. He looked out there and he was going, he was presenting Jesus Christ, the body of God. Jesus Christ who is God fully and completely. He was out there watching people get saved. Preaching the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. He's preaching truth and he comes back to check on him to see how they're doing and wolves have come in and, and just totally destroy almost all the work he does. And he's crying night and day with tears for three years. He has to go and have to pick up the pieces and he's got to correct him. That's why you read First and Second Corinthians. He's really correcting him. Because someone else came in and messed him up. Galatians, he's got to go back in there writing letters. and He's got to come back and visit them. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. Don't you even remember what I told you? The true plan of salvation? These people coming in telling you you got to do works in order to be saved. First, Second Corinthians, you got these people coming in telling you there's no changed life. You can live however you want and do whatever you want. That's not the Jesus that died on the cross. The God of all the universe that died on the cross for sins. If he died for sins, why aren't you making sins a big deal? All sin's not a big deal. There's no changed life. And he's coming in there, and it's like he's seeing everything. They're not worshiping the Jesus that he preached. That's why he talked about if any man preach another Jesus that we have not preached, or another gospel that we have not preached, or receive another spirit that we haven't received. And then John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, talks about the Antichrist spirits in the world. They're receiving an Antichrist spirit that's faking the Holy Spirit. It's a counterfeit. And, and Paul's like, you guys are not, it's like, he's crying night and day with tears. It's frustrating. Brother and sister Christ, it's frustrating for me, and I've only been in ministry for, what, three years? There's brethren out there that have been in ministries for 12 years, and they're frustrated. I was listening to a Peter Ruckman, uh, ministry for 60, 62 years, and he's frustrated. He's telling people what to do as far as this is the book. You need to get in the book and you need to know this book as much as you're supposed to know this book. And you need to study it. You need to live it. 
and he comes back and they're all messed up. It's like he's got to start all over. It's frustrating. But we read there that it says, Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. It's talking about Jesus Christ. God there is talking about the Father, the soul, but it was his body that was crucified on the cross. Jesus Christ. Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgression. He was wounded for our trans, uh, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The blood of God is the only blood that can wash our sins away. If Jesus is not fully and completely God, God was manifest in the flesh. If Jesus is not God the Father, His blood could do nothing for you. And we get so frustrated when we try to preach to people that still refuse to let go of the pagan trinity. Oh, no, 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 it's God in three persons. The biblical definition of person is you have to have a body, you have to have a soul, and it's always referred to someone who's living. Body, soul, spirit, to be called a person. And when you ask them, Does, do you believe the Holy Spirit has a body, soul, spirit of his own? They'll say, no, I don't believe that. Then why are you using the word person? It's like you're dealing with people that are brain dead. Why are you using the word person? Persons, plural. Well, the biggest thing that they're falling in, and I'm not saying I hate them or anything. Please forgive me, brother. So I get frustrated. I get angry at this. What's going on is they've been taught that they can change definitions. Well, it's wrong to add to or subtract from the Word of God, which anytime you change definitions, it's going to lead to you adding and subtracting from the Word of God. It gets you to play God. But the biggest thing today that I see out there among the body of Christ is they like to change the definition of words. They even change the definition of words that aren't even in Scripture. Rapture. People get on to me. Why don't you use rapture? Because you look at the... It's not in Scripture, so I had to go to the world for the definition. You even go to Webster's 1828 dictionary definition. That's not what's going to happen. I'm going to stick with caught up or catching away of the body of Christ. And they say, well, rapture doesn't mean what that definition means. It doesn't really mean that. So they'd like to change the definition of even words that aren't in the Bible. But the words that are in the Bible, they like to change the definitions. Okay? Person, body, soul, and spirit. If you say God in three persons, you are saying that God the Father has a body and soul, spirit of his own, that Jesus has a body, soul, and spirit of his own, and separate from God the Father, and that the Holy Spirit has a body, soul, spirit of his own, separate from Jesus Christ, separate from the Father. You are saying it. You might not believe that, but you are saying it. And we get so frustrated, brother and sister Christ, because you've been out there, have tried to talk to people. I've tried to talk to people that vehemently hold on to this pagan trinity nonsense. And Paul, crying night and day with tears for three years. Wolves in sheep's clothing coming in and messing up the flock. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 also reads, this was another one. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. God the Father sacrificed his body. It was God the Father's blood that was shed on the cross. And it could have only happened if he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, the second Adam. He came in a body, second Adam. That's why he's called the second Adam. He came in a body that was capable of taking on the sins of the world. The moment he was born, he planned to die. And that's the thing, I know I'll get in trouble with some of the brethren, but that's the thing that I really don't, that's one of the biggest things I don't like about Christmas. We could take away all the satanic and wicked part of it, of the, um, you know, the Christmas tree, the lights, the gift giving that has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, and all this junk. But the thing that always got to me was that growing up, it was always about a baby Jesus. Like we're worshiping a baby Jesus. We never once talked about his life as far as leading to his death. The Bible buildings did because they're always preaching the gospel. They invite lost people in, put money in the plate, invite lost people in. They're always preaching the gospel every, time, every Sunday. They've got to kind of find some way to twist it and bring it back to the gospel because they're inviting lost people in. But as a family at home, if we're all false converts. 
I was a false convert for most of my life. All my family was. Um, we didn't. T we always worshipped a baby Jesus. Not once did we sit there and go, wait a minute. When Jesus was born, it was in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he came into the world to save the world from their sins, to die on the cross. It was just, you know, that's what you're supposed to do when you sit down. Anytime you sit down to remember the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, when God manifests in the flesh, the created body of likeness of sinful flesh, he gave up his old body for a body of sinful flesh, likeness of sinful flesh, so he could take on the sins of the world. If you're not talking about the crucifixion with the birth of Jesus Christ, you're not doing it right. Oh, we're just going to do this baby Jesus in a manger. and Okay, Jesus isn't a baby anymore. Stop worshiping a baby Jesus. John 20, 14. I'm sorry to go off on that. Please forgive me, brothers and sisters. I have no problem. If you want to sit there and you want to go over the birth of Jesus Christ on December or any other month of the year, but you want to sit down at a specific time of the year and say, I want to go over the birth of Jesus Christ, remember, remember, remember. His birth, his birth means nothing if you don't talk about his sacrifice and what he did for this world. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh to die for the sins of the world. That being said, what's he going to come back as? Is he going to come back as that lamb, that nice, gentle lamb that's just so fuzzy and cuddly and everybody wants to hug it and everything? Uh, John 20, 14. Turn to John 20, 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seeketh thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast, taken, hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned to her turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. This is Jesus Christ after the crucifixion. Mary goes down, Mary, I think it's Mary Magdalene, going down, and he's gonna, she's going to put ointment on the body and everything, but the stone's already rolled away, the tomb is empty, and she's wondering where they took her, sa her, her Jesus, her Savior, okay, where they take her. And then if she realized, Rabboni, Master? It's like she's, it's, oh, God's opening her eyes and she's seeing who it is. And this is Jesus, verse 17. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended unto my Father and, my, and your Father, and to my God and to your God. He hadn't ascended yet, so he's saying, Don't touch me yet. He doesn't have that glorified body yet. Don't touch me yet. Okay. Turn to Philippians 3.21. What's this glorified body? Philippians 3.21, it's a precious promise to us. Philippians 3.21. Let's go back to 20. For our conversation is in heaven. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit's in us. Opens this book to us. Our conversation's in heaven. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to keep reminding people every once in a while. We have to deal with this wicked world. We're here patiently waiting. We're doing the work of the Lord. Amen. But we should always be reminding each other that blessed hope. Our conversation's in heaven. That's where Jesus is, preparing a place. Did you know Jesus? Don't forget, Jesus is preparing a place for us. He's preparing a place for you. That blessed hope, He's going to call us home someday. If you grow old and you do the work of the Lord, and God kills you and says it's time to come home, you're going to get to go home. And be with Jesus. You're going to get caught up one way or the other. <laughs> Either soul or body and soul. I'm talking about in death, your soul gets caught up. Or body and soul, the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay, we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For our conversation is heaven from whence we also, we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. 
according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. His glorious body. When we see him, we will be like him. I'm looking forward to that. But he has a glorious body now. He's got that incorruptible body now. He's back to being that lion of the tribe of Judah. He always was, but I'm talking about he came as a lamb. And the reason he came as a lamb is because he knew he was going to die for the sins of the world. He planned it. He's not that lamb anymore. When he comes back, he's not coming back. Where it says God was manifest in the flesh, was, it's past tense. He's not coming back as a lamb. He's not going to be some big teddy bear that you can hug and everything. Okay. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, 1 John 3, 2, says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, Jesus Christ calls us home, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. That's where I got that. I'm just not making that up, brother. It's in the scriptures. When we see him, we will be like him. The Bible talks about in a moment in a twinkle of an eye. This corruption must put on incorruption. This moral must put on immortality. When we see him, he's going to say, Philip Newton, there might be a pause, Philip Newton, to get my attention. I look up, and boom, dead in Christ rise first, they are incorruptible. And when they start going up, boom, we become incorruptible. And we look up and we see the dead in Christ already rising up, and then we which remain shall be caught up with them. To be with our Lord, be in the air and be forever with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. He's going to give us new bodies. We're not going to have these frail bodies anymore. 1 Corinthians 15.53 1 Corinthians 15, 53. We're almost done. Let's start at 51. Remember uh, the mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. Remember, the great is the mystery of godliness. Sometimes God will reveal mysteries to us and let us know what's going to happen. He's revealing more and more of who He is to us as we get closer and closer to the catching away of the body of Christ. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means not all the brethren are going to be dead. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There is no more death for us. There's still death on the world, because remember, death isn't done away with until after the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. After Satan's let loose for a little while, he destroys the, all the earth, the people that were fakes and frauds, that, you know, uh, curse God in their hearts privately, because God knows their hearts. Then death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire. That's when death is done away with. But for us, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's almost, almost like right here, it's God showing us. It's not really mocking, but it almost sounds like he's mocking death. Where is that sting that you had, huh? O grave, where is that victory? You were all so pompous. Now what is it? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. However, verse 57, But thanks be to God, but, that negates that whole statement, the strength is death is sin and let's see the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but negates the whole thing but thanks be to God which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ we don't have to worry about it anymore the lost world does why because they don't have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ that's why we, we beg for them to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I've been pushing this a lot lately, because what we see going on out there, people think, well, I believe we can go in at any moment. We can be caught up at any moment, brothers and sisters of Christ. There's some brethren out there that think, well, we might be here for another three or four years. Well, even if you believe we're going to be here another three or four years, that's dangerous belief. You need to have the attitude that Jesus could come back any day. When brethren had that attitude, they did more for the Lord. 
Now this whole attitude, this lazy attitude of, well, Jesus might not come back for another few more years or something like that. And what it does is it promotes laziness. But even so, oops, even so, it says, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Even if you believe he's not going to come back right today, which you should, that he could, that he could come back today, you need to be leave, living every day. Like, you know, what's that th saying that they always say? It's like, if Jesus come back in four years, you tell somebody Jesus come back in four years, how much work are they going to do for the Lord? Versus somebody you tell them that he's going to come back in a year. How much work are they going to do for the Lord? Versus you tell somebody he's going to be coming back in the in next month. The one that says, what, I've only got a month to try to earn some rewards and please the Lord and do things for the Lord? i got to get busy. That person's going to just go crazy doing as much as he can for the Lord. The person over here with four years, eh, i got four years. I can just you know, kind of do things here and there. Do you see how dangerous that is? You need to have the attitude in your heart looking for Jesus Christ every day because that's what the Bible tells us to do. Jesus is going to come back any day now. That's the attitude you have. Get busy for the Lord. Get busy for the Lord. Now, remember, when we're going to get into, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 113. When I'm talking about when Jesus comes back, remember the story about Moses hitting the rock twice. Remember that? He hit it the first time. That was good. He was told to hit the rock. He was told the second time to speak to the rock. Why was he told not to hit the rock the second time? The first time Jesus came in the likeness of... I always say the second time, but we can say the first. In the Old Testament, it's not that he came. He was there in the Old Testament. But when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, that's the first time when it comes to Moses. He hits the rock. Jesus died for our sins once. It is finished. The second time he comes back, it's not going to be like that lamb. Mike and me, uh, low, hum, humble, lowly, mild, meek, letting people spit at him, letting people rip his beard out, letting people whip him, letting people pour out every inch of his blood, letting people mock him. He's not coming back like that the second time. That's why Moses wasn't allowed to hit the rock, wasn't supposed to hit the rock the second time. God honored it for the people, but Moses got punished. He wasn't allowed to see the promised land. I mean, see it. He wasn't allowed to go into it. Then, he'll go into the promised land in the future, in the time of Jacob's trouble. But turn to Revelations 1.13. Is Jesus coming back as a, as a lamb? Revelation 1.13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Remember, John saw Jesus Christ. He walked with him. His head was in his bosom. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. And when he sees this man, he's looking. He's like, he looks like him. Is that, is that Jesus? It looks like him. Like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool. Not the texture, the color. I know it's hard for a lot of... It's not hard for us, brothers and sisters Christ. It's Satan doing his best to mess up the word of God and to get people away from the real Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus was a Jew. The Jewish people are over there in Israel right now. You want to look at see what Jews look like. He's not a black man. Jesus is not a black man. He's not a white man. The Catholics would have you believe he's a white man. A prissy, prissy boy. No. He's a Jew. But this is white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Judgment. Verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as, it, as if they burned in a furnace. Remember, fire is also a... Um, it's doing like the color. It's talking about the color of his eyes. But remember, fire is an uh, outward showing of, the, of God's glory, the glory of the Lord. As they burn in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Look at this. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The word of God. The written word. Spoken word. 
And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. His countenance, the glory of the Lord. It's God manifest in the flesh. Does this sound like a lamb, someone who's meek and mild? Or is this someone to be afraid of? Is this someone who's, it can be kind of scary. Well, let's see what John's reaction was. And his countenance was the sun shineth in his strength. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is no longer the John when Jesus came, when the Bible's talking about that God was manifest in the flesh. This is no longer the John that was leaning his head on Jesus' bosom, listening to him talk. No, this is the John that the Jesus with his new glorified body, and he's hitting the ground. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, the fear of the Lord. See, they didn't fear the Lord when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. You better believe there's going to be a fear of the Lord when he comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Opens his mouth and just with his word wipes out the 200 million man army. And then tramples over him with the horse and the blood is just everywhere, just trampling all over the horses, splattering all over the horses, I mean. No fear. He has no fear. He's not that humble, meek man. We fear God. They the lost world when he comes back is going to fear him. And he laid his hand upon me saying unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. Puts his hand on John and says, fear not. Brother and sister Christ, we're not going to have, we're going to fear our God and Savior, absolutely. But it's not going to be the same as them out there, the lost world. When they get called up to the uh, great white throne to be judged at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus rules for a thousand years with the rod of iron, we still fear our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because He's God Almighty. But we're not going to have the same fear that the lost world's going to have. He puts our, His hand on us and says, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Don't worry, John. You're one of mine. Fear not. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't worry. Fear not. You're one of mine. I am he that liveth and was dead. That's my Lord and Savior. That's what Jesus is coming back as. Sorry to go so far around, but brothers and sisters in Christ, in the Old Testament, Jesus had a body. It was the angel of the Lord, or any time that it said the Lord appeared to somebody, physically appeared to somebody in the Old Testament, that Lord was Jesus Christ, God the Father, in His incorruptible body. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. When it says, God, I behold, I show you a mystery. How was God able to give up His incorruptible body and come in the likeness of sinful flesh? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there's stories where, you know, he's talking, Jesus is in the body of uh, in the womb, and you have Jesus, the incorruptible body, the angel of the Lord, talking. How can that happen? I don't know. Great is the mystery of godliness. But as we saw in here, God wants us to know him. And he shows us more and more of who he is. And what the Bible states is in the Old Testament he had a body, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He gave up that body to be in the likeness of sinful flesh so he could take on the sins of the world. So he could die for you and me, brothers and sisters of Christ. So his blood could be shed, so our sins could be washed away, and we could be reconciled to God and to be with him someday for all eternity serving him. And I look forward to that. And we've got to preach, brothers and sisters of Christ, that in the future, Jesus is not coming back as a big teddy bear. He's coming back down. He's coming back to set things right. Remember how we always talk about it'll take God to to it'll take Jesus Christ to fix this world. This world is so messed up. It'll take Jesus Christ, and it will. He will come back to set things right. And when he does, he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. It's not. He's not coming back to say let's all hug one another. He's going to come back to enforce what is right, and he's going to stand in everybody. As the Bible says, by the time the great white throne judgment happens, the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. 
that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, every one of us should give an account of himself to the Lord. We're all going to have to give our account to the Lord. The false, I'll say this one more part and then we'll end it. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this is to be the feared. This is something to be feared. Please understand, I'm not trying to be fear-mongering or anything. But this false teaching out there that when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to be standing up there as the, like, you know, just this huggable lamb. And he's going to hug it. He's the lion. That's why the judgment seat of Christ is scary. And the Bible teaches us that we can have boldness in the day of judgment if, if we faint not. If we stand, stand, stand. God, get, our, get that junk out of my life. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to do work for the Lord. But do you know there's going to be Christians that stand up there at the, at the judgment seat of Christ that are going to be scared? It's not, it's not this. He's the Lamb of God when He came. In the likeness of sinful flesh. When we go up there to stand before him, you saw how John saw him, fell at his feet as dead. It's a scary thing, the judgment seat of Christ, if you're not living for the Lord. If you're not letting the Lord get that sin and that wickedness out of your life so you can focus on him and live for him. It's a scary thing, brothers and sisters of Christ. And I'm doing this as motivation. Get busy for the Lord. Your prayer life needs to be strong. Your Bible reading life needs to be strong. You need to be getting through this book at least two to three times a year. Okay? Your Bible reading needs to be strong. Your Bible studying needs to be strong. Hiding God's Word in your heart means to live it. That's why the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You need to be hiding this in your heart and living it. And you need to get busy working for the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you got to get the courage to stand up to your family members and witness to them. You've got to get the courage to stand up to your lost friends and witness to them. You also have to get, have the courage to let them go. That's a hard thing too. You preach to them, they don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. I've had to let go of family members because if I kept them in my life, they would have pulled me away from my Lord and Savior and His Word and living a life of Christ, the temptation. You have to have the courage to let them go and just keep praying for them. You gotta get the courage to go out there and lay gospel tracts everywhere, hand gospel tracts out. You gotta have the courage to talk with the brethren about the Word of God. Well, I might not know anything. Talk with the brethren, fellowship. Your prayer life needs to be strong, brothers and sisters in Christ, especially in these last days. Are you praying without ceasing? When you're working and doing something, are you talking to the Lord? Talking to the Lord about your life and your faults? Talking to the Lord about the brethren, how they're doing. You're talking to the Lord about how bad this world is. You're talking to the world, Lord about His Word and wanting more understanding, Lord. Or even thanking Him. Remember, in all things we give God thanks. We give God glory in all things. Is that prayer, how's that prayer life doing? He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. But He's not coming back that way. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let's get out there. Let's continue to abound in the work of the Lord. Let's patiently wait for that day where we get to be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And while we're waiting patiently, we need to be abounding in the work of the Lord. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank you for watching and I thank you for the prayers and I thank you for all the help I've gotten from the brethren. Especially the men in ministry. So, I will see you in the next video.